First of all, uh, welcome to Hoover, uh, Hoover's Washington, D.C. office. My name is Mike Frank, the director here. And tonight we're going to have a discussion about a couple of things here and there. It's uh, <laughs> political parties and political dogmas, what has changed and why. It's going to be, an, I think, an open-ended discussion of some of the things that have happened in recent years and what they portend for the two major political parties, different kinds of political coalitions, uh, and what it means, and what, what victory might look like uh, after we discuss what's wrong uh, with our two, our two very esteemed guests today. Quickly, uh, the two guests today, first of all, Henry Olson <coughs> sadly came down with a, a case of food poisoning, so he had to um, uh, opt out a couple hours ago. But uh, we have, still have two all-stars here tonight. David Frum, a senior editor at The Atlantic, uh, former speechwriter for Pre President George W. Bush. Uh, he's written a number of books. Um, one that's coming out soon, I guess this month? In this a week, month. yeah. In a week, Trumpocracy, the Corruption of the American Republic. Uh, he's also written other books, including one of the 1970s, which I, as a decade, I think that stands out in a very unique way in a negative sense. Uh, I read it with great pleasure at the time. Um, and he's a commentator about many aspects of American politics and will have a lot to say. Mark Lilla, did I get the, your last name right, Professor? Professor of Humanities at Columbia University, uh, contributes to the New York Review of Books. And uh, his recent book, uh, Once and Future Liberal, After Identity Politics, is, it came in the aftermath of an op-ed that Professor Lilla wrote for the New York Times a couple weeks after, or 10 days or so after the 2016 election that stirred up a real uh, debate, which I think is the uh, ultimate tribute to any kind of, not just an op-ed, but then subsequently his book, which we can talk about uh, today as well. Um, so what I thought we could start off with is give Professor Lilla a chance to go through your critique and your frustration with identity politics. First of all, kind of what it is, what it does uh, to folks, and what it's meant for the political uh, system we're in today. And I want to add quickly that David wrote a terrific review of uh, both Professor Lilla's book and Henry Olson's <coughs> working class Republicans, which I also encourage you to read. So, want to get started? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me with that? Yeah. Um, though I don't want my summary to dissuade you from buying the book, which is available on an Amazon where they take Visa Master and American <laughs> Express and soon Bitcoin. Um, well, um, why don't we start with what identity politics is and, and what, it's, what it's become. Um, we've always had interest group politics in this country, obviously. And some of those groups uh, can be defined as identity groups, if you want to use that word. So women, African Americans, Latinos, gays and lesbians, and so on. But the conception of, of of uh, mobilizing behind an identity was within a conception of interest group politics. We have an interest, we'll mobilize, we become part of the system, we become part of a larger coalition, we share some wider aims with some other groups, uh, we know we have to make trade-offs in order to achieve what we want, and above all, we're interested in governing. Why? Because the only way to help our interest group is if we govern. Well, that kind of identity politics, if you want to call it that, uh, has been replaced. And I sort of tell a story in, in the book about, I think, how that happened by a kind of identity politics that's really fundamentally about individual identity. It's about the relation of the self to itself and the search in society for public recognition of one's definition of oneself and of one's private subjective experience. Now, uh, that uh, approach to politics is really an approach, I think, to cultural politics and not institutional politics. That's part of the problem. You know, as I go out talking about the book and engaging uh, with my um, uh, with my detractors, it's just become more and more clear to me how important this word woke is. That 
what the people who are young people especially who are riled up about identity politics want is for you to see the world the way they see the world. They want to be affirmed in themselves, in their identities. And of course, their identities, they often now think of as these unstable things that are cobbled together with, with various, uh, you know, has various dimensions, intersectionality, and, and, and all of that. And, um, and that is not a, that's not a political goal. It also means that uh, there's, there's a weak sense of what political debate is. They want you to see the world the way uh, they do. And a, a, a typical phrase, and um, I, I ran into this again uh, last night having a drink with a foundation, uh, a liberal foundation head here who was arguing with me about the book and kept saying, you don't, uh, you don't get it. And not getting it means you're not woke. <clears throat> That's different from saying, here's my argument. Let me persuade you. You haven't been persuaded. It's meant to be a conversion experience. <clears throat> now, two things result from that. One is that um, if your politics are an expression of your intimate experience, of course you're not going to want to debate with anybody. Because if anyone questions you, what's being questioned are not your opinions, which are at some distance from yourself, and you yourself will want to revise, but rather it's an attack on yourself. Secondly, you will not be focused on institutional politics and persuading people out there. So an example I often use when I go on the road is I will ask students how many you are, uh, are, are for abortion rights. Most of their hands go up. And I say, OK, how does identity politics help a poor black woman get an abortion in Texas? Silence. I say, well, let me tell you what has to happen. The Democratic Party has to be competitive in Texas to make sure that the state of Texas doesn't add any barriers to whatever national rules there are. In order to become competitive in Texas, you must convince Texans. To convince Texans, you have to find common ground, a language of what you share, and you have to listen to them. Are you ready to go do that to fight for abortion rights there? Not a single hand. So they have been depoliticized through this kind of ideology, cultural ideolo ideology that they've adopted. And I call it pseudo-political in the book. And it means that they become useless for real political action. This is not true of young conservatives. Young conservatives will go to a summer program. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll do an internship. Uh, they'll be able to tell you what their principles are. It doesn't happen on the other side. And one of the reasons, for the, the thing I'm now coming to realize is that one of the biggest problems on my side of the aisle is that liberals have outsourced the education of their young to the university. Conservatives don't do that. You grow your own, as they say in California. Um, and um, I'd like to see that change. So I'll just stop there. Just one, one quick follow-up. Your, in your book, you draw a distinction between centripetal versus centrifugal forces and movement versus the uh, kind of the emotional side. Could you just quickly explain how that affects the political uh, coalitions and, and uh, the debate? Yeah, well, well, you know, as you know, the, the dynamics of, of, um, of uh, both identity politics and movement politics in general, internal dynamics of every movement is that the way you come to lead the movement is by being the most radical person in the movement. That's how you begin with flowers in 1967 and the weather underground in 1971, right? This is a natural thing that happens to any movement like that. The more that happens, the only way you, uh, you retain your power within the group is by being increasingly uncompromising. And you speak in terms of compromise rather than trade-offs, right? That, OK. I want a little bit of this, you want a little bit of that. We might have to trade these things off. And so uh, the Democratic Party thinks of itself and is now a collection of movements and interests, 
not so much a machine working together. Maybe it's never been that. Whereas uh, party politics forces you to come together and, and come up with a common program. And when I suggest that young people might want to do that, they keep saying, but you want me to compromise. How can I compromise on my identity? So I don't want you to compromise on your identity. I want you to trade off getting one piece of legislation you care, off, care about and maybe waiting for another day on another one. And a message not received. David, in your review that, of Professor Lillo's book, uh, Henry's book, you write toward the end, uh, the haunting question behind both books, however, is whether there still exists a social basis for the politics they want. Both men yearn for politics of broad national coalitions, supporting uh, broad national programs, but that kind of politics flourishes uh, not because smart and patriotic people think it desirable. Uh, it flourishes when it flourishes because it accords with the nation's deep geography. And then you go on to talk about uh, some of the differences uh, that are out there today that may not have been there 40 or 50 years ago. Could you develop that a little bit and maybe right. respond to what Mark said? Well, I, I read these two books um, together, actually more or less by happenstance. But when I read them together, I, they, it very strongly struck me that they, they belonged on the same bookshelf. Um, and um, because what, what both books were, were a, com, uh, a comparison of an unsatisfactory present, one for the Republican and Democratic Party, against a better past. Um, in your case, um, a much more, um, as you say, legislative Democratic Party. In Henry Olson's case, um, a, a view of, of Ronald Reagan, especially the pre-presidential mm -hmm. uh, Ronald Reagan, who spoke very much in concrete terms and very, very much about um, uh, the impact of what government did, and the federal government especially did, on the pay packages and uh, living standards of very ordinary people with whom Ronald Reagan always identified. Um, and what I worry about is um, that this country is uh, this country is changing faster than its politics are. Um, and I think one of um, I mean one, one of the ways to, to think about this is how stable so much of American politics is. If you can, if you look back over the past twenty years, if, if Rip Van Winkle were to fall asleep in nineteen ninety and wake up in twenty fifteen. And say, who, who, who are the leading candidates for president? Bush and Clinton. <laughs> what are they talking about? Well, health care in Iraq. <laughs> now, imagine that time traveler stepping in that machine, having the backward experience, going back 25 years uh, to 1965, which is the same distance from 1990 as 2015. The whole world's different. The cities are on fire. There are liberal Republicans. The two most important people in Washington, D.C. are the head of the AFL-CIO and J. Edgar Hoover. Um, it's, it's just an unimaginably different world. Um, the, the United States, I, and I think many of us who are older, I, I don't think we've absorbed um, the magnitude of the social changes that have happened just over the past 15 years. The impact of immigration, um, the impact on middle class living standards, um, the, uh, uh, the crisis of health um, in, that has happened in, uh, to, to middle class Americans. The United States has decreasing lifespan, life, lifespans um, for baby boomers. That did not happen during the Great Depression. The only case in a developed country not in a state of war where life expectancy goes down is in the po post-Soviet states. Mm -hmm. The United States is having a post-Soviet. Now, none of us are. I mean, we're all, you know, we're all doing great. Um, uh, but, um, and we, we're going to live for a long time, and we have very stable lives. And I mean, ev every day there's some new amazing flavor at Starbucks. Um, <laughs> um, but Speak uh, for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in New York, they, they turn up their noses at Starbucks. But, but here, here in real America, <laughs> where we drive. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, and this, uh, this is, uh, this is the, the world that produced the, even the possibility of a Trump presidency. I mean, if, people, if, if you're electing Donald Trump for president, you're obviously not thinking about how do I get things passed that I really want to get passed. And that make imaginable, as, rather than laughable, an Oprah candidacy. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen, but that may just be my own conservatism at work. Um, this, the United States, I, I think we have a lot of, we have, we idealize the way politics was done in the 30 years after World War II. Um, 
you, thank you for mentioning my history of the 70s. The big argument of that book is that the, the experience of those years from, uh, of the middle part of the 19th century is the most aberrant period in American history. And it's an experience formed by something that America had not had through most of its life, which is hypermobilization for war. Um, two wars and a, and a Great Depression, which forced standardization. Uh, the United States had conscription. It had a level of federal intervention in the economy. It had a level of equality um, and a movement toward equality that it had never seen before. And that what happened as the era of mass mobilization for big wars ended was the United States went back to being what it was in the 19th century, a much more vociferous society um, with much, where people had much less in common with one another. Um, so that, that what Mark is describing and deploring, and what Henry Olson is uh, describing and regretting, uh, is in many ways uh, the politics of the country catching up to the sociology of the country. Mm -hmm. yeah, can I ask you, yeah. David, though, just to clarify one thing for me, and is, is when you mention immigration that it comes to mind, that um, there are two ways in which we might have changed. One is concrete social changes, and the other is um, the way we think about ourselves along with that, right? And I've always thought that so much of the immigration debate, it's hard to separate out the significance of actual immigrants being here and the significance of people thought, people's thoughts about immigration, uh, immigrants being here. So um, which do you think has been more important? I, I have the sense that for you, it's, it's actually these concrete social changes that you think have been more significant. I, I do, but I think you can put them both together because I think in those years between 1917 and 1975, when we made the Mer America that for most of us is the, the America of our imaginations, the America which most of us grew up, um, uh, that America had as one of its foundational myths a story about what had happened in the age of mass migration from 1880 to 1920 that was largely an after-the-fact romanticization. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll give you a, 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 an anecdote that sort of sums up how it seemed at the time. Uh, study of the First World War, one of the mysteries of the First World War is how unbelievably provocative uh, the, the Kaiser's Germany was toward the United States. In retrospect, it seems insane, the things they did. Um, they, they really f pushed the United States to a point where it, mm -hmm. it had no ability to go to war. It uh, had no opportunity to work. So the, uh, the man who was the um, US ambassador in, um, in Germany during this period wrote a mem an autobiography or a memoir of his period. And I'm very, it's a period I'm very interested in, so I, I read it. And he tells this, this story that he would, he would go and reproach Zimmerman, he of the famous telegram that proposed a Mexican invasion of the United States, another how could they have thought of such a crazy thing idea, um, uh, to complain about one or another outrage. And uh, Zimmerman said to him, we're not worried about you. The United States has no capacity to make war. You're not an organized society of any kind. In fact, there are 500,000 veterans of the Kaiser's army living in your country. And if you tried to go with, to war with us, you would find yourself with a military uprising in your own country. And uh, uh, the ambassador gave a reply that he quotes in, uh, that in his book that was once very famous. Now you can see when I give the reply why it's forgotten. He said there may be 500,000 veterans of the Kaiser's army living in the United States, but there are 500,001 lampposts. <laughs> okay, ha ha. Um, but the level of repression brought to bear against the German minority um, yeah. in those years was unbelievable. I mean, with the, the, the things that, you, that we heard about after 9 11, you know, uh, when there were, I think, um, uh, you know, there's some incidents, there's some bullying, there, there, are, there are three hate, hate crime um, homicides. Uh, what happened in those, and the United States before the First World War had the bloodiest labor relations anywhere on the planet, by far, by, by orders of magnitude, almost always on ethnic lines, where uh, the, people, the, the people on one side uh, who would be uh, deploying the force um, would be of one ethnicity, um, and the, 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 the striking laborers who would be subjected to violence would be of another. And of course, it, and the United States, of course, had, um, I mean, a campaign of incredible violence of white against black through the South. Mm -hmm. And immediately after the First World War, a level of violence um, in the cities to which many blacks had moved that looks like nothing so much as pogroms. I mean, it, it actually, and the level of violence that you saw in the United States in 1919, again, was greater 
than the level of violence you saw in war-torn Germany by the Freikorps against ethnic minorities and communists. The numbers of people who were killed, you know, in just in uh, the, the biggest riots in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of people. Probably the total toll in all of Germany in the Spartacist uprisings was less than the toll in just that one, one urban riot. Um, so um, when you say, how, what was it? How do we think about it? Um, I think the, how we think about it reflects how it was, and how it was reflects how we think about it. When I was um, <clears throat> reading the uh, results of the election this last year, and the, the one number that jumped out at me, and I'd like to ask your reaction to what it might mean, was the 67% uh, of, of, of non-college educated whites who voted for Trump. And subsequent to that, Pew did an analysis, and they, their number was that McCain in, in 8, 08 had received 58% of that vote, and Romney 61, and then Trump went 68. And in terms of identity politics analysis, does that large, and, and also the exit polls indicated that was about 34%, I believe, of the electorate, but Roy Teixeira at, at Center for American Progress thinks it's higher. He puts it above 40%. What happens when, first of all, is there a threshold where some group becomes an identity group in their political behavior? And if you think that the non-college educated whites are either near that or already at that level, what does it mean when such a large group of, of, uh, of a demographic suddenly sees themselves as having more in common with themselves and other people as opposed to a minority group that might be 8 or 10 or 5 percent of the electorate? When you get to 40 percent saying, hey, we can play this game too, what does that mean for our body politic and our democratic system. Yeah, well, I, I actually wouldn't use the word identity, and that's why I, I bristle when I'm asked about white identity politics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I prefer the word tribal mm -hmm. because it's the, to speak that language, the intersection of class, race, religion, uh, geography, Right, mm. and so if you read a book like Ali Hochschild's very important book, *Strangers in Their Own Land*, she goes. This is a Berkeley uh, sociologist who went uh, for five years every summer to um, a, a community near Lake Charles, Louisiana. She <laughs> she met a woman on a plane one day, and the woman was talking to her. And, she, and Ali, who is a Berkeley sociologist, right off the rack, you could just describe her right away, <laughs> and she's wonderful, very nice. <clears throat> And she was disagreeing with this woman and trying to think about why. And the woman said, uh, you all ought to come down. And so she did for five years. She went down every year and tried to, and does a kind of thick anthropology of what it's like. And whiteness as white as non-blackness plays very little bit of a, a very small role in this. Or it, it does only in relate, it, it's more immigrants native, right? Uh, but it's a confluence of all these things that leads to a tribal mentality. And uh, that I think whites who um, you know, are not of the same class or not in, in the same geographical areas uh, don't come together. However, um, it's possible to frame it in terms of identity on both sides, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and I think it is true that there were all these appeals, subtle and not so subtle, in the Trump campaign to these sorts of things. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's very important on your side of the aisle to police that. Mm -hmm. um, because we all have a stake in, you know, that not taking us over. Um, the politics of the American South, from the com coming of any offer of black suffrage after the Civil War, are politics of white against black. But the politics of the northern United States were a politics in which the category of white did not exist until very recently. Um, and uh, Ita Italian immigrants competed with Irish mm -hmm. immigrants, um, uh, sometimes very violently um, through, through organized gangs. Um, Protestants, Catholics, uh, that's, the, that's, that's the driver of Massachusetts politics. I and mean, when, when um, Henry Cabot Lodge faced uh, against John F. Kennedy, um, they were not talking about tax rates. Uh, <laughs> uh, and 
Um, there's, a, there's a line in one of Philip Roth's uh, short stories where a boy comes home with a black eye and uh, his, his mother asks what happens and he says, I was, I was beaten up on the way home by the Catholics. And the narrator explains he used the term Catholics in the broad sense to include Protestants. But of course, that's a very Jewish joke. <laughs> 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 um, uh, that begins to change with the, the large scale migration of, of blacks from the south into the cities of the north. Um, beginning in, uh, during the First World War, accelerating during World, World War II, and really accelerating in the 15 years after, um, after, after World War II. Um, so a lot of people who hated each other uh, before World War II discovered that maybe they, they, they were moving to the same suburbs, they were intermarrying, these ident ethnic identities. There was a lot written about this time and in public interest in all the magazines we grew up with and that Mark edited. Um, these identities began to blur. Um, they lost their distinctiveness, uh, also in the confrontation um, with, with blacks versus whites, but but it still was not that it would have seemed weird. In, I mean, in 1980, to talk about white politics marked you as a person of the left. In the, no one thought that way if you weren't on the left, because these other inherited identities seemed uh, so. Um, Reagan's big success was his big breakthrough with Catholics. That's what it meant to be a Reagan Democrat. You were a Catholic, um, and you had voted Democrat, and now you're voting Republican, and that was a big event. Um, it's. Uh, that has changed. Uh, um, immigration has changed. You, we are now seeing the birth of a white identity, and not just in the United States, but across the developed world. That what you're seeing, the, that the old parties of right and left, which used to be divided by their attitudes toward capital versus labor, by their attitude between state sector and private. The party of the left was the party of labor, and especially the party of labor in the state sector. The party of the right was the party of you know, professionals, managers, owners, and especially people who worked in the private sector. Um, that just does, doesn't describe politics at all anymore in Western Europe. There's a party that is rooted in people whose grandparents lived in the country, and there's a party that is rooted in people whose grandparents did not live in the country. And, all, and though they have not completely forgotten those older definitions of why you're conservative, why labor, why you're a Gaullist, why you're a socialist, why Christian Democrat, why social Democrat, increasingly this new kind of politics is coming to the fore. And we see that happening in the United States. Um, one of the things that I think is very, I talk about this a little bit in my book, one of the things that is really remarkable is you hear a lot of talk about how liberal millennials are. If you, uh, that is interpreting a demographic change as a generational change. If you look at white males under 30, they are not liberal. They are not liberal at all. Um, and in fact, uh, Romney did extremely well among uh, white males under 30. He did, uh, so he did not so well with white women, but it's better than you might think. Um, and, and Trump did very well with, with my, my, white males under 30. And when you, when you ask, when you do these sort of deeper probes about do they feel they're getting a fair deal, um, you know, one, one, the, the, and this is maybe the thing you report on your campus events. I mean, one of the things that um, is one of the drivers of, of this change is um, we have a, a, you hear in a lot of places that um, these uh, young men under 30 are told, because you're white and un male and under 30, you're a person of privilege. Mm -hmm. saying, well, how come I'm living five years less long than my grandfather did? Um, I don't feel privileged. I feel persecuted. I feel oppressed, um, and I feel lied to, um, and that uh, and that is exactly um, how you get social convulsions. Um, re revolution re revolutions are made by downwardly mobile for, uh, elites. Um, they are, the, and uh, America has a lot of downwardly mobile elites. Let me um, put something on the table. I <clears throat> one of my obsessions in life is studying congressional districts and the, their uh, demography and um, having worked there at a number of different junctures. And one thing I've been struck by is how almost perfectly, in other words, if you were doing a gerrymandering and you wanted to create a safe Republican district versus a safe Democratic district, the Republican district would have really high proportions of married couples, a lot of people between 35 and say $100,000 of income. You'd have a lot of people who work in manufacturing. You'd have a lot of people who served in the military. Um, and you'd have people with uh, middle levels of educational attainment, high school degrees, some college, maybe an associate degree, certainly not graduate degrees, and not a lot of dropouts. The Democratic districts that generate um, the 100 percent Americans with Democratic Actions type members um, have the opposite. They have an overabundance of people at the low and the high ends of those kinds of different measures. And I was just wondering, you know, why do you think that is? And is that a healthy d divide? It's sort of like there's, there's a, you know, uh, <laughs> Barbells versus bell curve <laughs> distributions, and we want to 
address that? Uh, how it happened or what the consequence? Or, or both. I mean, what, does it surprise you, or is it something that seems to be um, cooked into the cake these days when we see the political fights um, unfold? Well, I, I think, you know, 1972 was a watershed year for this and what happened in the Democratic Party uh, and what it ended up, the consequences of that. Um, um, I guess it, you know, when I look at other countries that uh, I spent a fair amount of time in Europe and this, it, the same economic forces are creating the same barbell distribution, mm -hmm. right? And so the Socialist Party in France, for example, I think is going to cease to exist mm -hmm. because it became a party of educated elites and they had union members, right? Mm -hmm. Union members went off to the National Front and, uh, and now they're, they're a rump, they're nothing. They're, they're, they're a rump party and so Macron, <clears throat> has come in this in middle as this kind of uh, messiah, you know, with your message here, you know, you don't know what it's uh, <laughs> quite what it's uh, quite what it's it's about. So I think, you know, these economic changes are driving a lot of that. That plus the fact that um, we're all living in it, our advanced democracies, I would include Japan, with legacy political parties that the parties are a legacy of the post-war world largely. And the cleavages that they represented back in 1945 to 1960 are no longer the cleavages in our society. But we have these legacy parties. And so there's a mismatch there. And so my question is whether there will be a, refor uh, you know, a reformation of political parties, which is much easier to happen in Europe than here. Mm -hmm. uh, here it seems it has to happen within our two parties. But in Europe, whether um, this, um, however you want to describe them, court and country, global, local, however you want to make that distinction, whether that's going to become a meaningful party distinction. And once it is, politics is going to get a lot healthier, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, you won't have people who are turned off by the system because the party choices don't, and the differences between the parties, which are minimal, don't match the real differences that are in society. When you ask this question, this is where we really miss Henry, because yeah. I mean, he, would, he would explain right. to us th how this affects sheriff's races. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Henry, one of his, I, I, think, I don't think he does this to be funny, uh, but he will periodically call, there'll be some, Election in Saskatchewan, I'm originally from Canada, that I'm not paying a lot of attention to. And, and he will ask, why did Red River go the way it did? <laughs> and and there's, you have to do a certain amount of like, and that, like you don't want to say, how did it go? Because then, like just you have to, <laughs> you look That's for clues. Great, yeah, uh, um, uh, the point is, is when I, I wrote an article about this just after the 2008 election, because I, I was interested in this, this subject and um, looked at a number of districts where this had happened. Now, to some degree, what is going on is simply coincidence. It's just, or it's, it's something where the thing you're seeing has its own cause. So I, I spent some time um, in, in St. Louis. And notice that St. Louis County, which is where Richard, the district Richard Gephardt used to represent, was trending Republican. Where St. Louis City, um, which was having a lot of gentrification, or, you know, by Midwestern standards, a lot of gentrification. It wasn't, it wasn't San Francisco, but it was happening. Mm -hmm. It was becoming more and more Democrat. Mm -hmm. So what, was what wasn't that there was one kind of person who was moving mm -hmm. up into St. Louis City. It was that St. Louis City offered a ver both had a heavily minority, heavily black population that voted Democrat for one set of reasons. Mm -hmm. And it also had amenities and housing stock of a kind who that were attractive to people who arrived and voted Democrat for completely different reasons. And the effect of this was not, although you, you got a 100% or a very mm -hmm. liberal Democrat, mm -hmm. you also then had in, insanely bitter factional politics within the Democratic Party because mm -hmm. these people didn't have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. What was more striking, what was happening on the Republican side of the line, on, on the Republicanizing side of the line, which this was an inner suburb with a lot of houses from you know of the period around World War II, smaller houses. Um, and these are people who, would have once been upper working class mm -hmm. people, you know, aerospace space people doing well in the brewery industry, and now they were sort of the um, the frayed white collar mm -hmm. middle class. So here, I think, is one way to explain. I think what is, what is going on here. I mean, in the United States and across the globe, we built very ambitious 
state systems of social insurance and redistribution in the 30 years after World War II to achieve social stability. We'd been frightened by the war. We'd been frightened by the Depression, frightened by communism. We built these systems. And these systems created winners. And some people in the society were cut out of these. We're not allowed into these systems. But these systems, if you got in them, Medicare was one of the great deals of all time, especially if you got in early. Social Security, if you got in early, a great, great deal. The GI ban bills and, and, and early suburbanization, this was, a great, this was a great offer. The French have a useful term. Um, uh, do I translate it correctly if I call it acquired rights? And these are, it's not like free speech. These are not the rights of human beings. These are rights that are acquired through you know, negotiation and through politics. Mm. The six-week vacation. God did not give us the six-week <laughs> uh, vacation. But if you have a, a six-week vacation, you become very attached to it. And if there, if, if there are people who begin to think, you know, well, not, every, you know, it's not everybody in France has a six-week vacation. A lot of people have no vacation at all. So why don't you take, make do with four weeks so we can give two weeks to somebody else? And people go, bananas. Um, and, and, and those people then, I mean, they got the six weeks from parties of the left. But the protection of the six weeks drives them to parties of, of the right. And I think you see a lot of that happening throughout uh, the, de the developed world. If you, that, that one of the basis of Trump's support in particular <laughs> is Trump is the candidate of the people who are the winners of the 19. 1945 to 1975 social insurance system who now feel that people are going to take it away. One last thing. I know I'm talking too long. Yeah. Uh, Theda Sokpol and a group of associates at Harvard um, University did a fantastic study of the Tea Party movement. There's a lot of foolishness written in 2009, 2010 about how the Tea Party movement was a libertarian movement. And, after, and then those things, those things were written. Then there was a lot of sort of money spent by highly organized groups to try to parachute an ideology on top of the Tea Party movement. But when you actually went and talked to the Tea Party people, as, as her group did, they were there to defend Medicare. Uh, you know, it's not clear that any, that famous sign, keep the government's hands off my Medicare, <laughs> th th that sign has been photographed. It's not clear that anyone ever carried it non-ironically, that, that all the people carrying it seemed to be like making a little joke. But if anyone ever did, it would not be a stupid thing to say. Because who else's hands are going to go on your Medicare? It's not that you don't know it comes from the government. Is it because it becomes it comes to the government, it's vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, to the government. And one of the things that defined Obamacare was it was a redistribution of scheme in which Medicare beneficiaries were going to see less growth in the future as part of the way, totally insufficient way, but as part of the purported way that they were going to finance a new health care benefit for other people. That's, that's mm -hmm. what makes the, the Trump kind of Republican. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, end on this point and give you both a chance to, on a positive note, define or describe what victory might look like in terms of the um, getting after some of the um, problems that we've identified thus far. Maybe Mark, can you start with that? Oh, I don't believe in happy endings. You don't? I, I don't read any, uh, watch any movie that has a happy ending, and I don't read any <laughs> books that have happy endings. Um, well, I would say th the one hopeful thing is, um, and I, I'm lucky in this way that I teach, and I teach 18-year-olds. And what's nice about teaching 18-year-olds in a great books curriculum is they haven't yet been taught. Um, they still believe that a book can change your life. By spring semester, that's gone, right? But if you get them in the fall term and plant this idea, right? And um, what I sometimes sense from them talking to them uh, when they're when they're younger, and we start talking about politics, and I and I, I was talking today. I met with Senator Bennett from Colorado, and um, I, I I was saying that I've never understood why American politicians, or politicians generally, I guess, keep promising gifts to people when. They can't deliver because life is complicated and hard, and you have trade-offs. But they keep making promises. There's one promise that any politician can make that he knows he can deliver on, and people will never be disappointed, and that's sacrifice. No one has asked people in this country to sacrifice anything for their country since 1964. Ronald Reagan, for all his talk about America being city on a hill, our role in the world, did not ask America to sacrifice for 
for our Cold War, to sacrifice for um, our hot wars. We have no longer a language of sacrifice. And what I see in young people, when I, and I end on this when I, when I talk in universities, and there will always be at least one and often many students who will come up and say, where do I sign? Where can I do something? Yeah? And so my book ends talking about um, you know, a language of civic liberalism as a way of putting forward the liberal message. It's one of what we owe each other as citizens as opposed to identity groups, interpreting the uh, welfare state in that way. I, the one thing I liked in Henry's book is he talked about Reagan offering an interpretation of the welfare state. Right, as if, you know, it's like symphonies only exist in their interpretations. And I think welfare states only exist in their interpretations. And Democrats don't have a way of talking about the welfare state as a civic enterprise. And neither party, because of the ambient libertarianism in our society and in our heads, is comfortable anymore asking people to sacrifice for each other as a noble thing to do. I think young people would respond to that. And I would like to hear Democratic politicians be out there first saying that I'm going to offer you four years where you're going to be worse off. That's why I'm hoping you reelect me in four years so I'm here in eight. We're going to make a national effort on problems X, Y, and Z. We're going to have 60 kinds of national service. We are going to do something about the opioid crisis. We're going to make you proud of your country again. But you have to sacrifice something. And it's not for that uh, you know, welfare recipient there or that bureaucrat there, but for the common good, a language of the common good. And when I see young people actually respond to that, then I become hopeful, which makes me deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> David, do you believe in happy endings? I don't believe in endings. Um, um, it just, uh, I, I, in fact, I think one of the things that is a pervasive problem in American politics is, um, is that Americans believe in this, 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 and this is how they approach their wars. This is a, there's a tipping point. You come to this moment of decision. And if you do the right thing, after that, everything will be fine. And if you do that wrong thing, after that, everything will be irredeemably terrible. And that was the theme of Ronald Reagan. It's the theme of Paul Ryan's most famous speech. I, I don't believe that. I mean, I just think that to, if you wake up tomorrow, and politics always continues. It never ends. Um, so there's no, so, and I think, um, I mean, there are many things I, I, I could say. Um, about things I would like to see happen. Um, th there are predictions I can offer um, that the party system really is um, out, of the, out of kilter with where the voters are. And mm -hmm. I think those things will have to come into alignment one way or the other. But I want to say one thing. I, I think here's maybe the thing I was saying. It's, it's important to say in, in this room to this kind of audience. Um, we all remember the scene of The Godfather uh, where Michael Corleone is dealing with the corrupt Nevada congressman who says, what's your offer? And he says, I, I, I can give you my offer right now. My offer is nothing. So it seems to me that the governing and owning and possessing and entrepreneurial classes of America, that's basically been their offer to everybody else since the middle 1990s. Their offer is nothing. Uh, there, there's economic growth. We'll take all of it. Uh, you get nothing. Um, and I think that has been driven by the fact that we have had an extraordinarily self-confident since the end of the Cold War, that people who have a lot to lose rate their odds of losing any of it very, very low. Their parents and grandparents who lived through the Depression and fascism and communism, World War II, rated their odds of losing things they cared about very, very high. And because they were afraid, they, made, they tried to cut more of the society in on the good things of life, which is, I mean, they weren't early Christian martyrs about it. They still have to keep quite a lot. <laughs> um, but there was a spirit of, you know, we have to make sure that everybody is invested. That, that I think, is one of the things that um, is an insufficiently told part of the civil rights movement. Um, the civil rights story was not driven by a lot of people deciding to be nice to a traditionally oppressed minority. It was America in a desperate global competition where many of the battlefields were in uh, in, or almost all of the battlefields are in places where people had darker skin, said it could not run an apartheid system at home and be competitive in that global struggle. And, uh, and John F. Kennedy was extremely explicit about this, Lyndon Johnson rather less so. Um, uh, since the end of the Cold War, we've had a very um, confidently, uh, and, and they're not 
from their point of view, wrong. I mean, the, the Great Recession, um, the only mass movement it provoked was actually a reactionary rather than a revolutionary one. Um, so they, they're not wrong. But and you, you have seen, that, and, and that has come to fruition um, with the Republican majority since 2010. This latest tax bill is a perfect example. It wasn't quite, the offer in that one to the rest of the society wasn't quite nothing, but it, it was as near nothing as you could get without actually saying explicitly nothing. Um, so what I would hope, I think one of the things that um, could make a difference is a greater spirit of responsibility in elites. I, I don't know that it's, it's John F. Kennedy type sacrifice. I think it's more sense of, of, of prudence um, that nothing is not an offer that is going to go on being accepted happily and peacefully for a very long time. So my, 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 what I would hope to see, and, and the, um, the bad things that I see ahead in the Trump era, um, the, the real possibilities of um, you know, very, very bad defeats of the Republican Party, um, a rise of a very robust and ambitious political left um, that, uh, of a kind that will make the ambitions of the Obama years that will leave them in the rearview mirror, that, that may mobilize people who have something to lose to say, you know what, better to keep most uh, than risk all. On that cheery note, would you join me in thanking these guys? And then we're going to turn to questions. <laughs> we have a couple of uh, microphones here, so please, um, gentlemen in the back. You were the first guy in the room, weren't you? OK, Stanley Kober. One contrast I've seen, go back to the 1996 election. Bob Dole said, I will be a bridge to the past. Bill Clinton replied, I will be a bridge to the future. The future won. Americans were optimistic then. What was Donald Trump's theme? Make America great again. Looking to the past, not to the future. And this is an element of the change that we haven't discussed. And I'm just presenting this to the panelists because to my mind, this is, this is fundamental. What has happened to that optimism? Experience. I mean, it's not just a psychological mood that settled down on people. And part of it has to do, uh, on my side of the aisle, with inflated expectations of the welfare state, um, an inattention to things like regulation, the growth of the courts, all the kind of stuff that you guys care about, too, and an inability to sort all that through and to earn the trust of the public that you're going to keep trying to learn, stop doing things that weren't working, try new things, and you keep a sense of hope if you're always, if, if you, your bona fides are, are there, right? But instead, as you know the story that ends got confused with means, and the means became the ends, and there was an attachment, certain programs, certain approaches. And um, uh, the party and its programs became delegitimized, right? And so that was experience. It wasn't just that, you know, you know we just need a shot to get us boosted up again. Um, but, you know, uh, Someone has to come along with plausible ideas, and, and not just plausible ideas, but to be trusted. You know, you see so many of these surveys where uh, they say you know, the candidates who really resonate are people who seem authentic. You know, and as George Burns, the actor, once said, "If you can fake that, you got it made." <laughs> uh, but 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 that authenticity gap, right? Um, w which is why I would like on my side of the aisle t to hear politicians who are not, you know, hope, hope is not an end, right? Hope is the byproduct of something. And, or yes, we can without saying what we can do, right? But a kind of modesty, a spirit of sacrifice in a sense that we're going to work through this together and I want to build your trust in me. Um. Let me break that question into, into two parts and dealing with each briefly. The first is, when thinking about the, the career of Donald Trump specifically, the hard question about Donald Trump is how did he win the Republican nomination? How he, the, that it is very dangerous, I think, to draw. That, that is a, a, an astonishing fact and really important and one that repays deep analysis. How he won the election, however, 
um, is not does not yield. Look, if, if the if the election had taken a slightly different bounce, if there had been 80,000 um, more votes for Hillary Clinton in the Midwest and 80,000 fewer votes for her in California, Donald Trump would not only have lost, he would have been actually one of the bigger losers in recent American history. He would have been, he would have been half a point, he would have done half a point better than Dukakis. If my memory serves, he would have gotten three points better than Dole. Um, so uh, the, in the presidential election, the question is why did the Hillary Clinton campaign, why did, why did she run six points behind where Barack Obama was? That's, that's the mystery of the, pres of the general election. Um, as, as ominous and significant as Trump's primary win was. But as to the question, where, where, uh, why more hope in 1996? Well, let me point to a couple of things. Um, the first is the aging of the population. You know, after a certain point in your life, the future <coughs> holds decline leading to extinction. Um, and it's natural to believe that what is true for you is true for everybody. Old people are attracted to pessimistic um, uh, visions of the future um, for good reason. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we're, we're a much older country, on average, than we were in 1996. And the part of the country that votes, the citizens, the whites, um, you know, the people who have enough, you know, a regular address and who aren't, you know, don't have cr criminal records, they are that much more older than they were in 1996. But the second thing is, um, I try to think of one brainwave since 1986 that top people have had, um, and we've had a lot of them since 1996, from, um, the stock market boom of the late 1990s, which ended in the dot-com bust, uh, through you know, the Iraq War, which I was a supporter of, through uh, the um, housing uh, uh, securitization of loans, uh, the mortgage market, uh, through the Obama recovery program. One of those things that didn't prove to be an absolute calamity for people who were not insiders in the game. Um, so uh, I think you know, one of the things that um, explains hope is records of success. I mean, Mar as Mark's great line about its experience. You know, I, I, one last thought on this. I, I, I talk about this in the 70s book. Um, if you watched a movie in 1970, whenever you saw a character wearing a white lab coat, he was, ba he was there to tell you the answer. Uh, this is the machine. This is how the death ray works. This is how the time machine takes you back in time. Um, you know, this is how we get a little microscope and a little submarine into the human body. Um, after about 1980, you see, he, he represents hubris. The next thing you're going to see is him disappearing down the gullet of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, <laughs> because the experts delivered, and then they stopped delivering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I guess um, uh, my position on hope, which I feel that we're uh, addicted to as a culture, other countries don't need a fix of hope the way uh, that we do. Um, uh, Franz Kafka had uh, a very simple-minded friend named Max Brod, who was his best friend and saved all his stories from the fire and wrote it. But he didn't quite understand Kafka. And Kafka used to read his stories to friends as a way of testing them out. And one night, he reads some story. And Max afterwards comes up to Franz and says, Franz, that story is so depressing. Um, do you really think there's no hope? And Kafka looks at him and says, of course there's hope, infinite hope just not for us. <laughs> uh, both of you spoke uh, a lot about how these trends are happening throughout the developed world. They're happening in Europe also. But there's a sense that they don't seem to be happening in Canada. And I wonder, I mean, is that sense correct? And if it is correct, it's the developed red world. Red world. Is it, how about red how red are they escaping? Are, uh, this, this, I'm sorry. Is, are you trolling me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one, one of the um, things my wife will complain about is she's, she'll see me at a party, I'll be in a corner talking animatedly, and she'll come up on me. It turns out I've been talking about Canadian politics <laughs> for the past hour, and, and she'll you promise not to do that anymore. And, <laughs> and I said, because people have this, Americans in particular have this idea that Canada is boring, whereas in fact the truth is much more dangerous. Canada is both fascinating and unimportant, and that's a much more dangerous combination. Mm -hmm. But here, it, I, I would say it is, the Canadian exception really is important. And group it with the two other countries that are not quite as extreme, as, but uh, uh, Germany and Australia um, are also less subject to these trends. And Canada, the least, those two, the runners up. What do they have in common? Um, and I would point to three things. Um, the first is all of them are the countries hit least hard by the 2008 downturn. Canada had the um, was the first of the developed countries <coughs> to return to pre-crisis levels, both of output and employment. And it did that within 18 months. Um, so mild experience with the 2008 recession. Um, second, if you break the economy up into income groups, the Canada's had the best performing middle class um, of any of the developed countries, Germany second, Australia third. 
And, and the last thing is the Canadian experience with immigration has been particularly successful. Um, that the immigrants, can, although Canada takes more relative to its population than the United States, they come from a lot of different places. Um, so there's no one language. Um, they tend to enter toward the top of the labor market. Um, so they, they uh, are a pro-egalitarian force. The effect of immigration is to lower the costs of a lot of medicine, bookkeeping, things like that are cheaper. Whereas in the United States, you know, manual labor is cheap as a result of immigration. Um, and uh, um, and there has been um, and and uh, there has been very rapid assimilation. Um, and so those three things. And so you do not have you don't have power, effective. Um, anxieties raised by the immigrant experience. Germany and Australia are very, in that respect, very different. The German experience with immigration, which had been quite positive until 2015, has turned very negative. Um, and the Australian ex experience is also getting, because of their geography, is getting, you know, they're getting more apprehensive about it, too. What about uh, the Canadian 1%? Do you have any idea what their share of income is compared to here? It takes about half as much money to get the Canadian 1% as mm -hmm. it does to get the American 1%. Uh, my question is for you, Mark Law. In your previous books, like uh, Stillborn God, you express a certain ambivalence to a very confident religious tradition in the public and political square. My question for you is, as, um, let's say, Bush-era compassionate conservatism becomes eclipsed by the Jacksonian right, do you feel a certain lament or nostalgia for an American conservatism that was more deeply infused by Catholic and evangelical theology and social teaching? Well. What I wrote about, uh, it, uh, wrote against in my other books were, was political theology, not public religion. And that's an important distinction. A political theology, as I understand it, is a theological account of the legitimacy of a particular regime, right, that appeals to uh, a revelation. Um, you can have, and we do have, uh, a robust religious, re robust religious traditions in this country who are active politically, but their acceptance of the liberal regime is not dependent on the theology of that. Now, at the fringes of the evangelical movement, of course, that's not the case. I mean, they actually do speak much more openly. I was a teenage evangelical for a while. I was a Jesus freak from the age of 13 to the age of 20. And uh, it was a very different world. I never had one conversation about abortion in all those years. We never really talked about politics. And um, the sense was you were American because you were an American. And the legitimacy of the system, uh, of the system depended on the Bill of Rights and consent and, and, and all the rest. And now that's getting a little mixed up uh, on the evangelical side. So I don't have a, a nostalgia for, uh, for uh, any of that. I mean, if I have a nostalgia, I guess, it's for um, smarter religion. You know, uh, Ross Douthat's book, Bad Religion, is just devastating. And he's absolutely right about all this. Or I forget his name, that evangelical historian who wrote that, maybe someone will know, wrote that book, Mark Knoll, The Closing of the Evangelical Mind. Yeah? That, for people who don't follow theology and what goes on, uh, you're missing a huge part of the story. It, the dumbing down of American Protestantism has had a huge effect on the American right. And you have to go and see what's going on in these divinity schools to kind of figure out why that is. I guess this is more for Mark. Uh, is there a moral equivalent of war? The reason I'm asking is that the language of sacrifice that you're invoking a language that was, you know, I think invoked by exactly two prominent politicians in our lifetime, namely John F. Kennedy and John McCain, uh, is, you know, is a language that's rooted in the martial experience. And one of the most important things that's happened to the United States in my lifetime is that the martial experience, which used to be a mass experience, mm. has now been subcontracted to another 1% of the population. And it's no longer available. I mean, there's a kind of a nostalgic affirmative reaction. You know, and the idea of sacrifice does a certain amount to move young people. But the anecdote you told, where do I sign up? In the old days, 
that question had an easy yeah. answer, <laughs> right? Yeah. It doesn't anymore. So, you know, to the extent that we want, you know, this new civic coalition uh, that you're, you know, that that you're calling for. You know, to be based on the notion of commonality through shared sacrifice, is there a moral equivalent of war? And if not, yeah. what do we do? Yeah, no, I, I think the only um, other equivalent is our reaction to natural disasters. And the fact that Americans still fly off to Haiti or fly off to different sorts of places to make a sacrifice there and, you know, the reaction after 9-11. And these things ended up being will of the wisp. They don't last long, right? You need the sense still that there's a crisis. <clears throat> but it was interesting, you know, with uh, what happened with the um, floods and everything in Houston. I mean, my attitude, my fir you know, the cynical, my first cynical attitude was, let's get government off your backs, guys. Yeah, but that wasn't the attitude. And it wasn't the attitude on the Republican side. Somehow we had to go in and clean up the mess that has come from lack of planning, ignorance of environmental factors, blindness to global warming, and all the rest, right? But Americans respond to that. And so it's a question for me, and I don't see that anyone has, has, uh, has tried. I mean, you know, there was the language of the war on poverty, but we had another war going on that got in the way. Um, whether you know, a, a rhetoric of crisis and sacrifice would, uh, would appeal to people, especially young people. So I don't think you necessarily need it to be martial, though, though the metaphors are obviously martial. Uh, hi. <clears throat> so I can understand, I think I understand, the economic insecurity of the under-30 white male and his father and longing for the days of their fathers and grandfathers where they were the top of the heap and why they would vote for Trump. But what I have a harder time and I don't hear a lot of folks talking about is how they square that need and desire and think that what Trump can do for them with the moral underpinnings of these groups, this tribe that supports him, who are, you know, for what I see, very conservative Christians. If if Barack Obama had stood on a national stage with his five children and his three ex-wives, he would have never won. And I just am having a hard time understanding how these economic um, drivers have overcome what are, you know, in these tribes, moral failings of this man. Could you talk about that a little bit? The first time I ever worked on a political campaign, I, I was 14 years old, and uh, I had a very simple job to do, which is uh, to go to a bunch of uh, houses in the riding and find out how many people lived in them. But I, I wanted to overperform. Um, so I, I got a clipboard and I got a pencil. And not only did I ask how many people live here, which is my job, I would ask, what do you think is the most important issue in the Ontario provincial election of 1975? And I would write, they would give me an answer and I would write it back. And I, I took it back to um, my boss, who was a grizzled veteran of 22 or 23, um, and he said, that's just a total waste of time. The, the, the mind of the voter does not work that way. To ask a voter what is the most important issue is like asking him what is his favorite prime number. Uh, it's a meaningless question. And the reason I tell you that embarrassing story is there was a big debate after the election. Is Are these Trump voters motivated by economic, cult cultural, or racial concerns? Because to the organized mind of the political, those are very clear different boxes, right? Um, that, uh, yeah, I, if, if, if the concern is we have a lot of immigrants in the neighborhood and my income has gone down, that's one kind of concern if I don't like hearing people speaking a foreign language. As it, but that's not how the voter experiences. These things are all one thing. So um, what Trump offers is a vision of dominance, dominance restored to the people who rightfully exercise dominance. Now, it, uh, I think there are a lot of people who wished he, he would display that dominance in a more benign way. Um, you know that uh, that you know that it's good that he puts people in their place, but maybe he, it would be better if he did it in a more gentlemanly way. But nonetheless, the important work right now that has to be done is people have to be put in their place, and that Donald Trump 
does. He just reminds everybody who's supposed to be on top and who's not supposed to be on top. And some of that fee is translatable into dollars and cents, and other, uh, others of it is translatable into non-dollars and cents that are also precious to people. Um, you know, we all, uh, you know, we're, we are not simply dollar and cent maximizing creatures. Uh, but there's another part of your question, which was the five kids and the ex-wives on the stage, right? And, you know, one of the big surprises uh, for me is the way in which evangelicals simply did not object to any of this, right? And all these Trump supporters who, who used to write books called The Death of Outrage. I want to call my friend Bill, my old friend Bill Bennett and say, why don't you put out a second edition, friend? Yeah? Um, and so that's a story of what's happened, actually, in this evangelical world that people really have to pay more attention to. You know, I'm urging you to pay more attention to this and learn about it and look at these preachers on TV and all the rest. Part of it is this long-term thing of the dumbing down. Um, but also a split his, you know, there was this rebellion at Liberty University, at, which you may have followed, right, where the students have rebelled against uh, Fal Falwell Jr. and uh, his, uh, his engagements politically. Some of them sent back their diplomas, and uh, it, it was a strong statement. And um, so what happens there, I think, will have an, will have an effect. But there's got to be, one would think, a crisis of conscience. And it seems to be coming on the evangelical side uh, from the young. Why not? I mean, one of the, I think, the really useful concepts for, from economics to understand the Trump years is the concept of revealed preferences, um, that we state, we state our preferences, but then we reveal what they really are. And I think one of the things we've seen in the Trump years is a lot of people revealing what their preferences really are. Yeah. Okay, on that note, please join me in thanking Mark and David. <laughs>